Did you know that you can watch many of your favorite GLC programs all in one place for free? Just go online at www.glc.us.com and click on the GLC Teachers tab at the top of the homepage. From there you can scroll through dozens of quality GLC video archives containing over 100 full-length programs, updated weekly, and covering topics from Bible teachings and current events to scriptural, financial, and personal health. We've got it all covered at www.glc.us.com, so don't delay, start watching for free today. From Genesis to Revelation, God painted a portrait of the Messiah and His salvation. The Old Testament, given to point to the Messiah. And the New Testament, given as the fulfillment of God's promise of a new covenant to the Jewish people and a light to the Gentiles. Join Richard Booker as he shares the unveiling of the portrait of Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. As part of the bride, those teachings will help to prepare you for the arrival of the bridegroom, who will soon sound the shofar to announce His coming. Shalom, Havarim. Hello, friends. Richard Booker here, and I want to welcome you to our program today. It's such a joy and honor to be sharing God's Word with you, and I trust and pray the program is a blessing for your life. This particular program is part of an ongoing series on teachings about Jesus and the original church, or the first century church. It was made up of Jewish people, uh, until later on in the book of Acts when Cornelius uh, became uh, a Gentile believer. But until that time, Jesus and all of his followers were Jews. Uh, sometimes we forget about that. Uh, we, we hear throughout uh, the Christian world the proclamation that the Jews, quote-unquote, killed Christ. But that's just not true. Uh, a small band of political and religious leaders in Jerusalem who were jealous of Jesus' success and popularity, they conspired with the Romans to get rid of Jesus. But the popular folks of the day, the, the average folks, the population, they followed Jesus and uh, looked to him to be their, their savior, their redeemer. Uh, we learned that uh, when Peter preached, there were 3,000 people who believed, and they were baptized right there at the southern slopes of the Temple Mount where the, the mikvahs, the baptismal pools, are still there. They, uh, we learned in a few chapters later in the book of Acts that 5,000 men believed, not counting the women and children, and uh, it was a normal thing to be married in those days and have a lot of kids. So we're talking about 15, 20 plus thousand people just in those two statements alone. And so we, we discover with archaeological findings that uh, Jesus may have had up to 100,000 followers. And they were all Jewish people. Of course, a large part of those lived in and around Jerusalem. So when this New Testament church uh, was being formed, it was all Jews. And, of course, they, they didn't have a building that they met in. That didn't come along to the 4th century under Constantine. But they met at the temple and went from house to house. They had house churches, we might say today. House fellowships recognizing that the people are the church, of course, not a building. <clears throat> and so they uh, listened to the apostles' teachings. They had communion. They had fellowship. They had love feasts, uh, holy love-ins, we might say, where they had their meals and times of fellowship. They had miracles and baptisms. It was just an incredible outpouring of the power of God as the proclamation of Jesus was being declared throughout the city. And so these uh, Jewish believers uh, are coming out of the synagogue uh, form and structure and pattern of worship, and therefore we can expect that that first century church had a very Jewish look to it and a very Jewish expression to it. The people celebrated Shabbat uh, on the Sabbath. They kept all the festivals. 
the men were circumcised. They ate only kosher food. Uh, and Jesus and the disciples, including the Apostle Paul, never changed that at all. And so part of all of that was the teachings of Jesus. They were very Jewish in their ways of expression. Uh, Jesus would use things around him, the local uh, way that people lived, their occupations, the various religious symbols. He would use those as his object teaching lessons. And they are called figures of speech or idioms uh, that you don't take literally, uh, but they're ways of expressing ourselves uh, to try to make a point. And usually these figures of speech can only be clearly understood by the culture and generation of the times. We have so many of them ourselves uh, in America. Uh, we've been talking about them in the last few programs. So uh, people 2,000 years from now, if the world went on as it was, which God forbid that won't happen, but Messiah will come soon, we hope and pray. But if... Uh, the world continued as it was for several thousand more years, it would be very, very difficult for people 2,000 years from now to understand many of our expressions. And like uh, he, he jumped out of the car and ran down the street, and, you know, and all these kind of phrases we have with cars and computers and technology, and uh, people would just not understand talking Texan, you know, like we do here in the South in Texas. Uh, you have to be in Texas for about 60 years to understand Texans. So we have these various ways of talking. So it's the same kind of problem. If you look back 2,000 years, uh, they talk different. We have a Middle Eastern book in a Western culture. So really to get into the words of Jesus, some of his more difficult words, uh, we need to go back and look at some of these symbols and expressions and figures of speech. We've been looking at a few. One we want to look at the beginning in our uh, program today. If you have a Bible and it's uh, convenient for you to follow along with me, we'll look at several of these figures of speech today. Uh, the one that I want to begin with is the teaching from Jesus about the golden vine the golden vine, and he uses this as an object teaching lesson in the Gospel of John and chapter 15. I have it here uh, for us to read from. If you have your Bibles, you could turn to the Gospel of John and chapter 15. Uh, it's this teaching that uh, seasoned believers are very familiar with. Uh, Jesus begins in verse 1. He says, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Ouch. We all know about that. who have been walking with God for a long time. You're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Jesus is using a vine here as an illustration. Of course, the uh, people in his day were farmers. They were agricultural people. They knew about planting and seeds and vines and branches and fruit and blooms and blossoms. And so he's going to use uh, illustrations that uh, were part of the everyday life of the people of his times. Now, one of the interesting things about this particular teaching is uh, something that the uh, Jewish religious leaders had done at the temple in the time of Jesus. They had the temple on the Temple Mount, uh, and what the Jewish religious leaders had done was to make a large um, 
golden grapevine. It was made out of gold, shaped like a grapevine, and they attached this to the entrance columns to the temple. It was a very large um, golden vine, grapevine. It was um, well known. Any, anybody that came to the temple in Jerusalem or for the festivals from the surrounding areas, they, they would have to pass under this vine. So, you know, the, the Jewish world of the Mediterranean people uh, knew of this golden grapevine. They saw it every day at the temple or when they came to the festivals. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, wrote about this vine, and here's what he said. He said that it, its beauty was a marvel of size and artistry, artistry to all who saw with what costliness of material it had been constructed. So it was very, very expensive. And Jewish uh, traditional writings tell us that it was actually used as a fundraiser. Now, we need to be careful that uh, we don't get uh, some ideas here and try to do something that we shouldn't be doing with fundraising, but uh, it was used as a fundraiser, and people who came to the temple could make a free will offering by buying a, a cluster, buying a berry, buying a leaf, pretty ingenuous here, you know, and if you gave a certain amount, you could even have your name put on it, like the plaque on the wall at the building. And so uh, it would be, you know, something of, of pride, maybe the wrong kind, uh, to see your name or your leaf or your cluster or your berry on that golden vine. And it was uh, an object that the people were very, very proud of. Jesus teaches around the temple all the time in Jerusalem, and he uses the things that are there as object teaching lessons. He, he would say, this golden vine that you're all looking at, it's a religious uh, symbol, it's an object, but I am the true vine. If, if, if you will give yourself in dedication to me, and have as much uh, commitment and pride in following me as these folks do that golden grapevine, then you will bear much fruit. You will have spiritual fruit in your life. I am the vine. You are the branches. Abide in me like, like the, the, the vine and the branch and the sap flows through the vine and flows through the branch and, and it produces this beautiful flower and blossom and bloom on the other side just by simply abiding in the vine. And Jesus is making this point that relationship with him is much more important than some out, outward religious object of affection that the people had. And if we would abide in him, the true vine, the golden life that he has in himself would be imparted into us and we would bear much spiritual fruit. This is the, the teaching of the golden vine. Now there's others here, there's so many of them that I'm going to skip over some because it would take almost, you know, another dozen uh, programs to go over all these things and we have so many more exciting things to cover. But I want to go over another figure of speech with you uh, that's very important and, and has troubled Christians for centuries. It's the, it's the figure of speech and the teaching on the light and the heavy. The light and the heavy. Now, if you have a Bible, you can turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 5, and we'll read a scripture here that you know very well, but... Uh, Maybe you've been troubled by what it means and never heard an explanation that really uh, rings true to you. So this is uh, Matthew chapter 5, and it's verse 27 is where it starts. It's a teaching about adultery in your heart. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, 
that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And then he says, if your right hand causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is far more profitable for you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is far more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. But what is Jesus talking about here? Plucking out your right eye and cutting off your right hand? This is, this is pretty extreme here he's talking about. Surely he doesn't mean this literally, and he doesn't. It was a well-known rabbinic way of teaching called the light and the heavy. And it, it meant deal with your sin when it's in the light stage before it's manifested and becomes heavy and the consequences are much greater. And we can see this here at the beginning of this statement when he talks about adultery or lust in your heart. If that's not dealt with in the light stage when it's in your heart, it could easily be manifested by the actual act of committing adultery or whatever sin it might be, and that's in the heavy stage. That's when the consequences are much greater, and that's when many people's lives are hurt and, and difficulties come about. Uh, marriages are broken, the divorce happens, or somebody steals something, or, or cheats somebody, or does something evil. It's, it's when the, the, the root of the sin is manifested by the fruit of the deed itself, you see. So it was a normal rabbinic teaching in the time of Jesus to deal with your sin when it's in its light stage before it's actually manifested in its heavy stage. And, and they would say it this way, pluck out your eye or cut off your hand. They didn't mean it literally, but they meant deal with the sin when it's just something you're thinking about, when it's still in the light stage before it becomes actually manifested and it's in the heavy stage. It's the light and heavy. There's a similar... Uh, teachings and wordings in traditional Jewish literature. Here's one phrase that says, The hand that promotes self-abuse among men, let it be cut off. Again, they did not mean that literally, but deal with sin when it can be dealt with before the consequences are so tragic. Uh, we do find in, in Saudi Arabia, where they actually cut people's hands off for stealing, they would take this literally, and uh, it, it's, it's such an extreme uh, misunderstanding of teachings of Jesus uh, that these people have. It was a figure of speech, a Jewish idiom. Another one that I want to share with you that you might find interesting is called sounding the trumpet. Sounding the trumpet in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we can read here, beginning at verse 1, Matthew 6, verse 1. Jesus says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men. You know, don't uh, give all of your big wad of money so everybody can see you and, and be boasting in that, to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Wow, is that interesting? All these uh, things that people do in their giving so they can have their name up on the, the berry of the golden vine or up on the wall, the plaque. No, there, if your motives are good, that's not a problem. But, you know, to be seen of men so you can be praised by men, well, those are the ones who will praise you rather than the Lord. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Then he makes this statement, Therefore, 
when you do a charitable deed or when you give money to help people, do not sound a trumpet. Isn't that interesting? Do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Jesus used this figure of speech. He says, do not sound a trumpet when you give your financial gifts to help ministries or to help the poor, to help the widows, to help uh, somebody who's in need. Now, it's interesting here when he uses the word, do not sound the trumpet. Here's what's going on here. In the, at, on the Temple Mount, they had the court of the women uh, where the women could come. And in the court of the women, there were 13 what we might call collection baskets or collection buckets or collection plates. They were actually boxes. And the way they were shaped, they were wide at the bottom but narrow at the top. And they sort of resembled a trumpet. And when you put the coins down in there, clang, 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 you were sounding the trumpet is the way the people would say that. And, of course, there were some who wanted to be seen of men, wanted the praise of men for, for their religious uh, duty of giving money, you know, to the poor and the widows, and they wanted everybody to know that they were giving. And so you put those coins down in there, and it makes a big clanging noise, and you're kind of looking around, making sure everybody's seeing you before you drop it down in. You're doing this for the wrong reasons. Well, the wrong motives. Yes, somebody's going to get help, praise God, but you're not going to get the credit from the Lord because your motives were impure. So he says, don't sound the trumpet. When you give your money, give it in secret. Uh, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. And then your father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. Better to have the praise of God than the praise of men. Now we have a phrase that comes from this very one here. And, and you know what it is. It goes like this. Don't toot your own horn. Right? Don't toot your own horn. Don't sound the trumpet. Don't tell everybody how great you are. Let everybody else figure that out and they'll, they'll tell how great you are. Don't toot your own horn. Don't, don't say all the great things you're doing, but let the Lord uh, honor you himself by doing the deeds that you're doing as, as best as possible in secret. Of course, there are times when there are public uh, happenings where these kinds of things are going to be made known, but I'm sure we all understand the point here. There's one more that we have time for in our program today. It's the good eye and the bad eye. It's a very important figure of speech that Jesus used, the good eye and the bad eye, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we'll look here at verses 22 and 23. It doesn't seem to be related at all, but, uh, you know, it's because we've got a Middle Eastern book in a Western culture. It's uh, Matthew 6, 22 to 23. Again, for those who might be able to follow along or maybe you'd like to take some notes down, or you could get the program here from prime time. I'm sure they'd be glad to make it available for you if you, if you write, wrote in or called in. Matthew 6, 22 to 23 says, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now this is a very interesting um, use of the good eye and the bad eye. 
maybe you've heard all kind of uh, speculations from ministers of, of what this is supposed to mean, and none of them really ring true to you. The reason is because this is a first century figure of speech, and it has to do with being a generous person. It actually has to do with money. If you keep going and reading the next uh, verse or two there, it talks about trusting God for your finances and that you can't uh, have two masters. One is money and the other is God. Uh, so the whole context of this uh, teaching by Jesus has to do with money and being generous. A person who is a good eye in this story here is a person who is generous. A person who is thinking about uh, the needs of others and how they can be a generous, a liberal giver uh, to help other people who have financial needs. And it says this person is, is going to have a, a, generally speaking, a person with a good eye who is generous, is going to be healthier, is going to be happier, uh, going to be more fulfilled and contented because they're not just thinking about themselves all the time. They're thinking about how they can help other people. But the person who has the bad eye are sometimes translated as evil eye. It's a person who is selfish, a person who is stingy, who just uh, try to hoards up his, his blessings for himself. Well, we, we know those kind of people. They're not happy people, you know. They're thinking about themselves. They have a bad eye. Uh, we can find this in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 9, Proverbs 22, verse 9, and Proverbs 28, verse 22 is the background. You can look those up for yourself and see that it's all talking about the same thing. So as we look at this last figure of speech, may the Lord help us to be outward-minded and not just self-centered. May the Lord help us to be generous. May the Lord help us to have a good eye to be thinking of other people and God will prosper you, give, and it shall be given unto you. God bless you, and I hope you will be blessed. Shalom. We hope that you're enjoying our YouTube series, GLC Essentials. GLC Essentials takes you back to some of the very first programs from our most beloved teachers in their original full-length formats. Available at no cost. Feel free to visit our website at glc.us.com where you can watch free new shows from our entire program lineup. You can also watch GLC 24 hours a day through our live stream located on the homepage. Be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel and, as always, please thumbs up this video. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus through the information on your screen. Thank you and God bless.